Good day, everyone. I'm going to discuss about introduction to IT auditing. IT stands for information technology. And then this is the new version or new term for information systems. While information systems is the latter term for EDP. And EDP stands for electronic data processing. So basically the terms would be EDP, electronic data processing, then information systems, then information technology. So do not be confused if ever I will be using them interchangeably in the conversation. So basically the first chapter will introduce us about the whereabouts, the what and what not of IT auditing. So our course is auditing in a CIS environment. CIS stands for Computer Information Systems. So if we think of a modern organization, there would be different resources that will be used there, particularly about information and communication. So anything, any gadget or equipment, that will be used to gather or collect information to process them and produce the output or desired outputs. Basically, they are part of IT. All right, so whatever computerized information systems present in the company, then we are going to audit. So that's what this course is all about, auditing in a CIS environment a computerized environment that surrounds a certain organization and then we are going to check if those particular systems are operating effectively as designed okay so here is it governance this is the process for controlling an organization's it resources including information and communication systems and technology so governance from the root word govern so how do we manage particularly the IT itself in the organization so if we think of IT this does not only involve the resources that we are going to make use of in the organization or business this can also be thought of as a department so a department in an organization, of course, or particularly the functional department, can be of any area or field or place. So for example, in our management subjects, we have learned, for example, that there are functional departments like sales and marketing, that's one, human resources, also known as personnel, you can also have production and logistics for some logistics meaning the movement of goods from one place to another so from for example the ordering of goods from our supplier to the company the goods are being processed or transferred from various departments for production and when they are being sold so from us to our customers so that for or forms part of the logistics so basically that's what logistics is all about which is also one of the functional departments accounting finance for some accounting and finance would be merged but for the purposes of our discussions I'm separating them then also we can think of purchasing as a department also we can have EDP, so EDP or Information Systems, IS or IT. So we are going to make use of IT now in today's world. So IT is one of those functional departments. So the overall corporate umbrella of the organization is being divided into functional departments so that the various functions can be managed effectively. So those functions are basically incompatible with each other 
and they are really of different fields and expertise and lines of specializations. That's why they have to be separated from each other. And as what I've said, IT is one of those functional departments. So as to how do we control the organization's IT resources, controlling is basically the fifth step of the management function. So going back to our management subjects, for controlling, we think of five management functions. So we have planning, organizing, staffing, directing or leading, and finally controlling. So our acronym would be POSBC. So planning, organizing, then staffing, directing or leading, and controlling. Controlling will basically talk about the feedbacks and these feedbacks if we talk of financial matters can be in the form of variances so we compare the actual and the standard the difference of the two would be the variance is the variance or feedback favorable or unfavorable now what would happen if the feedback is favorable so we are going to make use of that again in order to continue or sustain the positive outcomes or results of the processes or to enhance it further. While if unfavorable, so we are going to make use of the feedback so that we can improve the operations the next time around and we go back to planning. So governance is going to deal with management, I would say. So not just with controlling because we talk of IT resources these are also resources of the business wherein information is there in which information is a very valuable resource of a business that can make or break it. And the systems of communication will also be there because the organization is composed of different people and different departments in which information will be communicated from them to the other and vice versa. So systems are there in order to make sure that those information will be communicated also properly and orderly. And then we also talk of technology that will be used there. Okay, so Another one is using IT to promote an organization's objectives and enable business processes and to manage and control IT-related risks. So what we basically mean here is that the IT being a part of the organization, a separate department, has its objectives has its goals also which would support and complement the overall company organization's objectives they should be aligned to each other because the IT should support the organization or enterprise objectives for us to be able to achieve the objectives and the business processes and then in business we all know that risks are there some of the risks can be zeroed out but majority of our risks cannot be eliminated so what we can do overall as we speak is that risks cannot be eliminated but they can be managed minimized or decreased or lessened so that's why we are going to manage and control it related risks okay so i said manage and control so feedbacking is very important next in the it environment or world there would be guidelines that will be used so these guidelines are like our standards in financial accounting in which we have our international financial reporting standards or auditing international standards and auditing IT also has their particular frameworks or benchmarks or standards in which we can assess and evaluate as to 
what the effectiveness or efficiency of the particular IT systems of an organization is. So COBIT stands for Control of Business Information Technology. Now, COBIT is actually a framework. And then this is like available, we can research this online, but it's an exhaustive framework. So at least we just know what the point of this is. It will identify critical success factors in the organization, there are certain areas in which we can say that we are successful. And these particular success factors also have corresponding risks prior. So what are the risks involved, the cost involved, so that we can be successful in the field? And also we have the key goals. So goals are matched with our performances or the performances indicators. Are the goals being performed well so that you are able to have success in the field? And then we also have the IT governance model. So that model I will be discussing in another part as it's going to be part two of this particular session. Then IT governance framework begins with setting IT objectives. Of course, in any planning endeavor or engagement, we start with objectives. Actually, it's going to start with vision, mission, goals, objectives, but that will be tackled in chapter four. But I guess you guys and we already have ideas as to how planning would work in the organization. And then measures and compares performance against them. Yes, as being said here, the goals are being matched with the performances. If ever they are matched or if the performances exceeded the key goal, so we are successful. It's not necessarily that we are matched equally, but if the performances would exceed our goal, so meaning a favorable variance, so it will be favorable also to the company and we will be successful. All right, and measures and compares performance against them so that we will get the feedback and we can either improve our operations, add more, or really improve because that's a negative one. All right, so how does IT and transaction processing would work? So it begins with the collection of the data. So this is the input stage. If we think of IT, we normally think of the IPO flow, input, process, and output. So the input would be on the data, and then these will be gathered and collected and will be organized so that it will be easy or easier for us to process. Then when data or raw facts as defined, Will be processed they become information so information will be the processed data and then these information will become our desired outputs now the outputs if this is the accounting would be the financial statements which will be used for communication to users so similarly in this case because we talk of auditing in a cis environment we use software we use for example accounting softwares for us to be able to generate reports and we get the outputs so computerized systems example this transaction systems tx stands for transaction computerized transaction systems would increase some risks and decrease others yes that's true how or why it will solve perhaps the problems of errors on calculation on addition mathematical operations basically that is true for counting for example it is easier to add like a lot of numbers if we use excel or the software we don't have to calculate but if we do that manually prior to usage of computerized systems so that's going to be very crucial on our end and critical 
I would say. So it is easier for us to commit errors. However, with the usage of our computerized transaction systems, so such would solve those issues. But there would be additional risks that will be made or some risks would be increased. So there would be risks, for example, that our computerized systems would be hacked or I would say, like generally speaking, our integrity of the system will be compromised because there would be some hackers who would be getting into the systems or there would be viruses. So availability could also be compromised. So we will be discussing this more in the latter chapters and so on. So what we can do basically is that we are going to make some amends and protect our systems. Or we can also find ways so that the computerized transaction systems would be protected as well in the process. So that's the point of this particular line. Although it will decrease some risks, but it will also increase other risks. So there would be the trade-off as we speak. But then, before we proceed, so if we think, though, of the overall benefits of computerized systems, we would be happy. Why? By this one, we can now focus or think of analysis. We can devote much of our time as to how do we improve our company and operations and so on than before using traditional systems wherein we are going to emerge our or immerse ourselves with so many manual mechanical computational tasks that we don't have the energy anymore in the analysis. And the analysis is very important because in the 21st century, it is now more on problem solving skills. And those things are needed in this century. All right, so what do IT auditors do? By the way, as auditors, we are going to examine, evaluate an already done process. So it's not going to be us who will be making, implementing the processes or the information systems. No, it should be present, they should be present, and we are going to evaluate them if they are operating effectively and efficiently as designed. So as auditors, we don't have to be CPAs actually. So IT auditors, as being stated, can be of a bachelor's degree, of any degree. However, there would be edge if ever the course or program that we graduated or you graduated would be related to business and IT. Although the basic requirement is at least a bachelor's degree. And also we need more qualifications and certifications depending on the organization hiring the services of IT auditors. Also that is for competence in the field to make sure that those individuals who will be doing the audits would be competent enough to do these things. So the IT auditors would be making some of these engagements. So ensure IT governance by assessing the risks, evaluate the risks involved, and then we monitor the controls over those risks. So as being said, risks are there. We can manage them, we can minimize them. So how do we minimize them by putting some controls? So these controls are ways by which we can minimize the risks. So internal controls, we will be discussing them exhaustively. Can be any process, step, system, procedure in the organization that is being done in order to minimize the risks. So monitoring controls over those risks. IT auditors can be internal or external auditors. So 
if you say internal, meaning an in-house auditor, so there is really a department or a section by which a certain auditor would be doing IT audits, then this is subject to payroll. Although as a requirement, internal auditors should still be independent of those persons performing line functions. So as being discussed in our cost accounting subjects or management subjects, perhaps that there are two functions in the organization, it can be line or staff. Line, if you are doing the functions which are basically with the main line of the business. So example, if the business is, let's say, a manufacturing company, so those engaged in the production and sales would be under the line. And all other else would be under staff, meaning support function. So the IT auditors would be doing support function, not line function. Okay, so if in-house, but what if external auditors? External auditors are auditors who are just there for the purpose of the engagement. They are being paid their professional fees or retainers fees, and they're not part of the payroll of the organization. So they're also independent, much independent of the organization or business or client. The internal auditor is somehow to be emphasized because the internal auditor is paid by the business organization. So that's why it's going to be a challenging task to prove independence. But we will discuss that more in our latter sessions. Okay, works on many kinds of audit engagements. Yes, that's true. There are so many engagements that we are going to tackle. If I cannot discuss it here, probably in the next part of this one, it's still part one. So financial versus IT audits. Audits can be financial. We focus on the economic information which would be processed through the accounting process and produce the financial statements. And then IT auditors may work on financial audit engagements in that case. So IT audits, on the other hand, would be looking into the IT as I said a while ago, information and communication systems available in the organization or business. Now, normally, if we think of the two, there's a versus here. Are they really competing with each other? No, they are not. They're basically supporting each other. But just to be clear, IT audits would support the financial audits. So how is that possible? IT audits would audit the information systems of, or information technology systems of the organization. So the IT would be producing the reports. And then the reports, example financial statements, would be audited by financial statement auditors. So basically, the financial reports are the results of the IT systems. So if we audit the IT system and we find such to be reliable, that can have impact on the report. So if they are reliable or effective and efficient, then our financial reports would be competent and also reliable. Although that's not going to be 100%. Anyway, so not like all the time because in auditing subjects, perhaps you have known that there would be fraudulent financial reporting, meaning intentionally good appealing financial statements or reports, but in fact, the company is losing. So those things, guys, about fraud, which will also be discussed in this particular course. So that's going to be chapter 10, fraud and forensic auditing. Anyway, so those are some areas. Now, what if, for example, our IT audited I mean, the IT audits have found out that our IT systems are not reliable or ineffective and inefficient. So can we then say that our financial statements are also not reliable? So we might say, I said we can or may say that our reports may not be reliable, 
but that is not also a hundred percent meaning it's not a guarantee because it is even really possible and probable guys that we can have clean report audit report meaning unqualified and modified report for audit that the financial statements are reliable and reasonable in all material respects or aspects so that's also even possible so what can we do is that we are going to really examine if those areas of weaknesses in the internal controls or it systems of the organization can still be improved in the process and they did not affect materially the reports and the amount so those things which are really now auditing like hardcore so hopefully you did have your good times and shares in your auditing subjects prior to this course auditing in a cis environment so to continue and anyway we will be discussing them just a tidbit in other courses it auditors may work on every step of the financial audit engagement that's very true so again it auditors can work hand in hand with financial audits but i would say it audits would be around would be present even prior to the services of financial statement auditors because it auditors are parts of the input and process while financial auditors would be looking into the outputs already okay i hope that is clear i repeat it audits would be on the input and process stage or stages or financial audits would be on the outputs now standards such as sas number 94 so this is with the u.s standard statements and auditing standards guide the work of it auditors on financial audit engagements so basically if we have again our standards for financial accounting and audit financial statements audit in it audits there are also standards that are available in addition to the auditing standards then IT audit work is likely to increase as internal control evaluation becomes more important. So if we now think of internal control being part of the evaluation really, which will, by the way, play an important role in audit because that has to be evaluated so that we can determine as to the number or the quantity or the extent of the testing and evaluation that we are going to do with our financial statements, with the accounts, with the industry evaluation to which that particular entity belongs to. So if that's the case, then we have to consider the impact of IT audit. Okay, so IT audit would be there and would help. And then if this is a US setup or setting, this would really be a requirement for large entities. You call them accelerated filers. So in US, they have the so-called accelerated filers wherein they would be required to have a separate report audit by an external firm that is so-called an audit on internal control over financial reporting. So that is a requirement in addition to the financial statements audit report so basically if you are an accelerated filer or an entity is like that there would be two reports as what i've said minimum in addition to all other reports which are not covered in this course okay so those will be tackled again exhaustively in latter chapters next what are the skills required to become it auditor so as what i've said we will be needing the technical skills so where do we get this from our college education for the theoretical and perhaps some practical skills as said we need bachelor's degree but there is an edge if we are having the degrees of information systems computer science and accounting the certifications would be of a cpa so there would be an edge if you are a certified public accountant, but it's not a requirement as what I've said. Then you also had or have certified fraud examiner. 
So this is an additional certification available in US. So if we go global, there would be more skills and more certifications that would be available for us. Unlike in Philippines, that we have the standard CPA. But should we go to US and other countries like UK and other countries, there would be additional certifications available. So those certifications can also be considered. So a certified fraud examiner, then we also have the CIA, certified internal auditor, CISA is certified information systems auditor. Then CISSP that is on information standards, security systems protocol something anyway, and special technical certification. So these are the certifications available. In terms of skills, it can be technical and general personnel. So technical skills, if we talk about the software, the language, then the technicalities about IT, but we also need communication skills. It's very important because rarely do ID auditors work alone or in isolation. They work with teams, hand in hand. They communicate with people. So that is the reason why there would always be personal communication skills. We can communicate. We have the ability to understand people and members in the team. And we can also be understood, meaning we have the language so that others would understand us and business skills. Okay. All right. So another one is professional groups and certifications. You have the alphabet soup. So this would be the other organizations in which they are going to provide certain certifications to those who would be taking the examinations. So ISACA, Information Systems Audit and Control Association for CISA, that's Certified Information Systems Auditor. For IIA, that's the Institute of Internal Auditors, you have CIA, Certified Internal Auditor. Okay. Then ACFE is Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. So this would be the detectives who can really investigate about fraudulent transactions happening in the company, could involve civil or criminal liabilities, and the certification would be certified fraud examiners. And then finally, we have the AICPA, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, who would be providing the CPA title. And is this the, I think this is certified information technology. Is this, I think it's information, technology professional could be right or even tax practitioner okay tax practitioner all right then how to structure an it audit there would be standards and guidelines coming from aicpa on the other hand the ifac international federation of accountants would be the overall body for the accountants in the world who would be providing or that would be providing harmonized or common international accounting standards and guidelines. Then we also have ISACA. This is again on the information systems auditors providing guidelines for audit, like IT audit to be exact or specific. So you have here the COBIT, Control Business Information Technology, and the audit standards. Then an overview of this book, basically there are 10 chapters that we are going to tackle then they are divided into sections, three sections. So section one, it is basically going to talk about chapters one to three. So introduction to IT audit, the legal and ethical environment and the risks and controls So three chapters. Section two would be talking chapters four, five, six, and seven. So chapter five, or prior to that is chapter four. Chapter four is IT deployment risks. How do we consider and manage risks when IT is already delegated or deployed or subdivided into a lot of different sub departments or tasks? Then after that is to manage the IT function. We talk then about IT telecommunications and networks and the risks involved. And if we operate in 
an electronic world, how do we manage the risk? The chapter seven, e-business risks. The chapter six is on IT, telecommunications, and network risks. So to continue, you have section three, that's chapter eight. That's going to be using computer-assisted audit tools and techniques. If we are dealing with advanced computerized digitized world or age we as auditors can also make use and should make use also of the digitized computerized advanced high-tech softwares because we will be left behind by our clients so we should also be adept of these updates in the technology aspect then another one is chapter nine that would talk on continuation of the risks still. So this is particularly on the IT audit process, so the entire process plus the risks there. And chapter 10, fraud and forensic auditing. Okay, so this basically ends the chapter. Hopefully you've learned something from our sessions then make sure to check out the particular parts in which it will be very important to you jot down notes then i'll see you next time guys for the second part of this particular chapter bye for now